Hi, and welcome back. My name is Sheldon McLeod, and this is Thinking Out Loud here, presented to you on the Saltwire Network. And as we know, uh, it's going to get cold, really cold. In fact, dangerous wind chills forecast as blast of Arctic air approaches Atlantic Canada. Doing a little quote-unquote research. I did a Google search. The coldest recorded temperature in Nova Scotia, minus 41.1 degrees Celsius, January 31st, 1920. It was in Upper Stewiak. That's where they recorded it. And that is minus 40, no matter what scale uh, you might be looking at. And uh, this had me thinking about a number of things, including, of course, our lived environment and the critters that live in it. And there's a man I know who has had a tremendous career. In fact, he is uh, the retired curator of zoology at the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History. Andrew Hebda joins the conversation here today. And Andrew Hebda, it's so nice to see you again. How have you been? I'm doing fine. Glad to see you, uh, uh, Sheldon. You look you look good. What's the matter? <laughs> I'm I'm working on it. It's good. Less stress yeah. in life is always a good thing. Great. Uh, and and my understanding, you used to have a hobby farm. Do you still are you still a farmer? Yeah, we're still uh, we're, we're still farming up in the Noble Shore, up in the Co- up in the Cobo Good Bay. We got about 250 sheep, more or less. And what was your morning like, preparing for a 40 some degree temperature swing? Uh, I'm picking low fruit right now, so it means sealing up the the big uh, the big openings in the barns on the the west and north side, uh, because it's like it's going to be that uh, penetrating wind, and that's going to be around for probably about 36 hours. So that's number one. And then uh, come this afternoon, we're going to go and start sealing up the cracks and crevices, and then uh, checking to make sure all the water supply is uh, well uh, well wrapped and heated. And I'm sure this is a you know a pattern be repeating itself for farmers and, and people in, in agriculture across our region. Uh, th- there was a story I don't know if you caught this uh, just a, a few days ago at Saltwire.com talking about uh, the cold will be good to help perhaps with the tick population. That's a subject I know you had uh, many discussions about and, and had many lectures about. Uh, is there truth in that, or, or is this a good time to kill off the ticks? Well, uh, if we don't have any snow cover. Uh, and we're getting uh, some um, some uh, uh, squalls passing through right now. Essentially, that uh, extended cold period, which is going to be, a, again, roughly about that uh, 36 hours, it's going to get quite warm on uh, Sunday afternoon. It's going to drive the frost line down and uh, drive the temperature at soil level down. Those ticks are hanging out in the uh, in the leaf litter, and they have a tolerance for a certain degree of freezing. They're, they have uh, both antifreezes in their um, hemolymph as well as uh, they also have some chiroprotectants. However, once you start getting down below around minus 5, minus 10, uh, then we start p- seeing some mortality. So the potential is there, especially with that wind, because that, what that wind is doing is, is, is removing, uh, removing a lot of moisture, removing a lot of, a lot of other heat that's around. So we will probably see some some impact on it. That's quite a difference from what we had in remember 2014, 15, right. where we had uh, sudden uh, we had no snow, no uh, no ground frost, and then fourth of fourth of uh, January we hadn't ended up with that much. So the ticks did very well because uh, there was no mortality. And uh, come springtime, when the birds flew through, there was no predation because they, they couldn't get at the ticks. Yeah, that was the winter that uh, came late and stayed even later. Uh, I don't one. think yeah. the lakes, the lake out front wasn't open in, on uh, the first of fishing season that year. So I, I guess in a lot of ways, people are wondering with climate change, with the odd cycles, the unusual cycles, you know, we're going to it's like above freezing in some communities right now down to minus 25 tonight uh, and then perhaps back up to above freezing temperatures on on Sunday into Monday. What does that do to the wildlife? I, it just it seems as though if, if there's not a consistency that it, that it may cause an issue. What is, from your experience does this tell you? Well, it's a question of how quickly the changes occur. If it's uh, if it's a slow uh, slow drop in temperature and a slow increase in wind, basically, then uh, they just uh, most of the animals that we see, and of course, we're not seeing any insects or other invertebrates right now. Uh, they uh, they'll reduce change their activity patterns. If you think about it, most of the large animals we see outside tend to be nocturnal, which means that they're active at night, which is when the temperatures are down. So essentially, what they're going to do is uh, they're going to go undercover. 
essentially the temperature itself per se is not that important but it's the wind is the is the big issue because uh again uh if there was no wind whatsoever you could be down to minus 20 or minus 30 without too much difficulty you could go out there and you could forage uh, you could uh, you could hunt for prey no no problem but once you get that wind it's costing you a lot more energy and that's the whole point is they've only got so much energy to be able to survive through the winter uh in in good condition and or survive period and so with that uh every time you get these massive demands on that energy in this case to keep warm then of course you're decreasing your your chances your survivability later in the spring so one single blast like this we may get some some effects on that but from the animal's point of view if we get these blast and then blast and blast and blast each time each time it happens they uh, they, they run into problems now we'll use an analogy that uh we're involved with quite a bit which has to do with hibernating bats so when bats go into hibernation you probably know they're very small a little brown bat weighs roughly about a uh, the weight is the weight of a, of a loony so of, of a loony so it's not very heavy and it has to it goes into hibernation it drops its temperature to the temperature around it every time it wakes up it has to burn energy to get temperature back to normal mammal temperature which is around 39 and uh they only have a limited reserve of that fat they store it behind the shoulder blades and so what happens they have the ability to wake up maybe half a dozen maybe another two or three above that times over the winter if the demand goes beyond that if they're woke, awakened more than that essentially they run out of energy and they're unable to wake up and or they you you'll see us with the, the white nose where you saw them coming out in the middle of winter time so that's sort of an extreme example limited number of en limited amount of energy you burn it up that's it you're you've, you've now stressed yourself rather severely We've had uh, a lot of conversation over the last number of years about uh, how deer have migrated to urban locations for obvious reasons. Uh, food is one of them. The other, you know, they love your, tu your, your tulips and your hostas. Uh, uh, but, but I suspect that because there's no predation there, there aren't hunters, there aren't people who are coming into towns with the exception of Turo that had that uh, limited urban hunt recently. But, but for folks who are wondering, uh, what happens with the deer when it drops to minus 45 with the wind chill and these large mammals are out in the, potentially in, in the, the extreme cold like that? Well, if you're looking at deer as, as a good example, um, you've got to think of the environment uh, in a little bit different ways. It's not a uniform environment out there, the uniform habitats, temperatures. It's sort of a patchwork of microhabitats and microenvironments. So what the deer usually do in extreme conditions, uh, and that be through most of the winter really, is uh, they yard. So essentially they will, they will aggregate or congregate in areas usually within a well-protected area where they're out of, where you don't get that wind you don't quite get that temperature drop we may get in open pastures right now we may get tonight what 27 27 and a half degrees but when you get down in those protected areas where there's no wind the temperature will be substantially higher so it could be maybe minus 15 or so uh, and so that pressure is off there's no wind there they've got a bit more production so that's what they do is they basically yard up and that also gives the ability then to as a group conserve conserve energy other animals which are more solitary or uh, more territorial so thinking for example of foxes and, and coyotes uh, they den up so essentially uh, you'll still see them active and we were just checking the pastures and there were there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, tracks from the last couple of days i don't think we'll see too much tomorrow morning so what they'll do is they'll just reduce their activity and they will not hunt so they'll go hungry they'll They'll, uh, they'll have a day of fasting or a night of fasting, as the case may be. So, but what they do is, as individuals, then they have their own little little microhabitats that they use. So, essentially, they're not exposing themselves. They, they, they don't put their, uh, their, uh, their heavy parkas on out there and, and, uh, and fight the good fight to try to, to show that they're better than everybody else. They say, well, okay, not good conditions. Let's just hang up and wait till it gets better. Uh, Shubanakini Sam saw her shadow. Uh, okay, don't that they have to wake up critters that normally hibernate, don't they? That that's not normal for a critter to come out on February second. Uh, well, uh, there's some animals, and you'll see it with squirrels. You see it with groundhogs. They all go into hibernation and come out. They're 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 active actually throughout the winter. Other animals are are will be act will be active only. For example, think about bears uh, that only okay. they may wake in once or twice in the winter, but the balance of the time they're asleep. So, so no, Shubanakini uh, 
Sam uh, would uh, is, is active quite a bit and if you make friends with the people at the park uh, they'll tell you what the activity patterns are there so right. but that's uh, but it, you got to make sure that the second of February is on one of the days when he's going to be when she's going to be up and about and uh, if not then you can certainly break wake her up type of thing and then the, she doesn't mind because there's always food every time she gets woken up. So that might explain why a few days ago when it was warmer, that skunk that lives down by my shed might have uh, come from a slumber and, and started rooting up in the lawn? Uh, wouldn't Well, it could have been rooting out in the lawn, but I'd imagine your lawn was a bit on the uh, on the hard side. on the uh, No, it was side. thawed. Oh, it yeah, thawed, it, thawed in the rain, yeah. Oh, well, that, that sounds good. So what they're going for is they're going for those, uh, generally speaking, large grubs or large larvae of generally beetles and you're looking whether they're uh, chafers or june bugs um and so yeah that's uh they, they'd be out they'd be hungry i mean if there's an opportunity to feed you get a nice we used to call them midwinter thaws remember that in the olden oh, days yeah, Back in the yeah day. i think we, we 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 had one that lasted this year like about three weeks or so so far <laughs> uh anyways yeah so that makes sense if they get an opportunity they're opportunists uh they'll go for food when it's available and they'll remember and if they can do it they won't and if not then they it's going to probably go back and go back and then up again and uh, wait for some more weather. I know the curator of zoology, you would be asked questions about a lot of different animals. And I, I want to ask your thoughts on there used to be a wives tale. I'm not sure if it was a wives tale, but it was certainly told by wives and husbands uh, that if you had a dog, people used to leave animals outside. And the thought was if an animal that a domesticated animal like a dog was left outside, able to get into a shelter, a doghouse or something to get out of the window, the cold or the weather, uh, that it was detrimental to their health to bring them inside because they may overheat. Does that make any sense? Is that scientifically sound? Uh, to a certain degree, uh, we, we certainly encounter that with livestock. There's some livestock which you really shouldn't bring into the barn because they're not, it's not so much the temperature as you start then increasing the, the moisture, the humidity, and then, uh, and then you're, you're, you're altering that the the healthy state of the uh, of, of the atmosphere around them. However, uh, number one in general, with conditions such as we've got coming up tonight, which are which are slowly coming and they're going to come in fairly quickly, uh, and they're going to be quite extreme. It's probably a good idea to bring them in, and of course, as soon as the conditions get better, then uh, then of course let them out. Uh, don't don't leave them in for the next uh, one to two weeks. So, uh, but it's it's one of those things if they're used to. The normal activity pattern is used to being outside. Then you should try to maintain that, but certainly knock off those those the, the mountain tops there because that's gonna that's gonna stress them as well. And even if they've been uh, prepping up a good uh, a, a good batch of uh, of guard of guard hairs and also that under fur to keep warm, um, conditions tonight are going to be a little bit on the on the extreme side. And even a good doghouse, uh, you know, it's it's. It'll certainly cut the wind, but it's not necessarily going to be the, the ideal thing. So you can play, if your dogs have been inside before, then certainly bring it in. You should be careful about leaving your dogs outside all the time anyways. Yeah, no, and, and that goes, uh, that's, that's a good warning. I guess it, it used to be much more common than it is now, and I think the SPCA will tell you that they get uh, frequent co uh, phone calls about animals that are in distress and certainly not advocating that. Saw a fake documentary yesterday saying, you know, thousands, of, millions of years ago, uh, the dogs were domesticated as companions and cats were domesticated, and we don't know why. Uh, but I guess the bottom line is if you have a, a, an animal in your house and you want to let them out, they're, they're probably going to tell you if they don't want to stay out. <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the short answer <laughs> what uh is uh, i guess your your final thoughts on you know this lived environment uh, the changes in, in temperature the swings uh this overall idea that climate change is making us a much more temperate climate and people would say where's the global warming when it's going down to minus 40 what does andrew have to have to say to that <laughs> well there is an overall uh, increase in, in global temperatures but we're not detecting it here living at roughly 45 degrees north latitude, uh, we're halfway between the equator and the North Pole, and so what was predicted probably about 20 years back, and certainly seems to be uh, seems to be there, is we're getting much more variation around that mean, so we're getting much more in extremes. Now, speaking as a, as a farmer who's been living out uh, on the uh, on the Cobequid Bay, one thing that I've noticed in the last 40 years, uh, the changes there are, they're, they're minor changes, but then we have a lot more wind. When we get storm events, we get more, much more wind. Uh, the wind was not an issue if you go back to the historical record. So I think we'll be seeing much more variation along that line. Where we're 
challenged here is that we're so close to the sea and then uh, you don't have to go too far out to sea even this time of year before you hit the Gulf Stream. So we've got we've got these extremes in sea temperatures. And for us, that sea temperature and the, the presence of that open water really affects what we're seeing. What is strange, we used to get a lot of continental cli continental storms moving through here in the wintertime. Now most of the storms we're getting are coming up the coast. They're, they're coastal systems like that. So. Um, what I see is I see some changes there. I see certainly a lot more variation. And I mean, this is this is what? This is February, okay? Like I said, 2014, we had uh, no snow essentially until the beginning of January. Uh, 2004, remember the uh, famous 17th of February, 2004? Uh, that was uh, White Wall and the same kind of thing. So these were, there always have been these kind of events, but within our lifetime, of course, we seem to be seeing these things a bit more frequently. So. Uh, uh, overall, global warming, yes, but we're not going to see the temper temperature increases. We do see minor things because we do see some species persisting that couldn't persist before. Uh, but other than that, um, I would say uh, be a good citizen and uh, let's try to minimize the impact that we have that may be contributing to this. Always good to talk with you. He is Andrew Hebda, retired curator of zoology for the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History. And uh, good luck with the critters tonight and into tomorrow. And um, as they say, uh, stay well, stay warm, and uh, stay healthy. Same to you, Sheldon.